because it is the jewel of the crown of LA County Library. It is definitely <laughs> it is definitely a place for the community to meet, and we like to do as much program as programming as we can. Today is a very special day because it's our first big adult program since the pandemic was over. Oh. It's been a lovely battle. Intel. Anyway, I'm going to just, we are having such a good evening tonight, so I'm just going to read some remarks. Um, we have such an accomplished set of guests today that I thought I'd better write it up. <laughs> so, um, Tonight, we have a special evening with two of our best Chicano poets from different generations. We have the young, and we have the younger. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we are very privileged to welcome back Luis Rodriguez. Oh, 
poems, and then uh, after that, Louis will read some poems. So it's a huge honor, though, I want to say it before. It started as a really you know, enormous honor to be reading here today, uh, to be sharing work with the uh, great Luis Rodriguez. Um, I remember uh, many, many years ago, um, not that many years ago, but many, 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 many years ago, <laughs> and many in my heart, uh, when uh, last time AWP was here, uh, we were, there was an offside Luis was receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award. And um, he said that oftentimes, that uh, Chicanos have a bad rap as being uh, crabs in a bucket, and then that, that's not what uh, that's not what his experience was. That he was helped by Sandra Cisneros, he was helped by uh, Juan Pereira, and that he was working with me, singling me out, and, uh, and, and you know, the way I am, I, I looked for the rooms to see who was hating, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that was actually uh, him doing that and spotlighting me that way. In many ways, uh, it helped me so tremendously. And, and, and there's a number of times where he's where he's mentioned me, and it's really. And just that, that gracious act that has actually helped me propel me to, to be able to do a lot of things. So um, I'm always grateful to Louis. So, you know, he uh, was teaching the prisons for a while. He actually uh, recommended me uh, for that. So now I now I teach the prisons. So I mean, there's so many things that's made the worst. So many doors that, that Luis uh, has opened for me, and I, I really I recognize that, and I really appreciate I appreciate him, and I appreciate the number of people in the room today. I mean, I see. A number of people here who, uh, you know, I, I want to echo Luis's sentiment that, you know, while the Chicanos do get bad reputation, we crash the bucket, point it down. And I have seen that, but I've also seen community come together. I see educators here, I see members of uh, the Associated of Asset Educators. I see uh, very incredible, talented memoirists uh, here, you know, New York Times uh, bestsellers here. I see uh, a whole community of people uh, who oftentimes do come together. You know, the, you know Jose Antonio, whose, whose work is right out there. Uh, I see, you know, um, some of my pressmates are here. So I see a number of people, a number of uh, aspiring poets and, and artists here who have in many ways not come together and lift each other up. And, uh, and it's nice about that. It's about a celebration of community. And uh, now I'm going to stop talking and just go. Sunday, I'm Levittown, Quarterback, Dirty Harry, John Wayne, Blackface, Minuteman, Moynihan, Gone with the Wind, Breaking Bad. Washington Redskin, Confederate flag, the sword, the dollar, the cannon, the scholar, the cavalry, the Ivy League, history. It's written by lightning. It's the rising smoke of the burning village. The ways in which victors keep their victims. The frontier thesis notes on the state of Virginia extraction, expansion, the wing of the West, Lewis and Clark, Smith and Wesson, and so the wagon with bloodshed and slave sweat, the crack of the whip, the law of three fifths, the crown republic of King Kong, the failures of reconstruction, the housing covenants, the greedy great migration of the saints and the Mexicans before Mexico. So far from heaven and so close to Monroe Doctor. To Davy Crockett. To prison industrial complex. A war on drugs is a war on our young. Bloody Christmas. Reefer Madness. 15 to life of four ounces East Oakland. West Baltimore. South of Brand, all over North. Plymouth Rock. Jamestown. The Rio Grande. Stolen lives. Stolen land. Some are born in summer homes in glacial groves with pain. It's always going to unfold from the pages of secret gardens with red from groves, but not I. See, I come from the stock of starry astronauts, beat the night sky, big dreams, and wide eyes, always running. Now the devil's highway through occupied America. All the way back to us on Mango Street. Also, we'll see him on the street. Raise a handball of the back wall of a banana born east of the river post Mendez versus Westminster, one generation with red lines. And diplomas that were signed with those dreams. And that skin need not apply to that kind of And if my story offends you, it's only because you made the mistake of seeking your reflection in my self portrait to see this. That's not be about it. Because some are born of the common core. Who respect the faces of this grace, the pages of doctors discovered, age to be explored. Where old world hardships crashed against new shores, New England, New Hampshire, New Jersey. New York, for others, push off Turtle Island, Aslan, do not call this brown skin. Child of the sun, son of the conquest, may he got no blood, running through the veins of the east side of Los Angeles. Do not tell him of native tongue, the song will best be sung. Do not tell him who I am. Because I was raised like you, miseducating some of those very same schools. 
of lessons and legends of honest Indians and Christian pilgrims and a nation of immigrants all united in freedom. It isn't until they pulled aside my white friend pointed directly at me and said, Scott, I judge you by the company you keep and you spend your time with this. And that same old story, 1646. The adventures of Uncle Sam stick up many went there. Show me your papers, I'll give me your labor. The melting pot was never made for the hands of clean. The American dream has always come at the expense of those who tucked it in. You don't know that. So you don't teach it. Could write you a book, but you won't read it. So you listen to you. And 1492, and the Treaty of Wyoming, and California missions, and Arizona schools, these racists, they try to race us as their kids in cities that bear our names. We learn some today to Ferdinand, to Minuteman, from Pio, to Alamo, from Bobo, to Waukee, the Indian, as it lives in me from 8 to 1643, trying to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds, can't have minds, they'll strike the plan of Allah, who's a part of, but keep your head up. That's how to eat that strong, crazy, Zapatista, Rich Nixon, through Napoleon, from Peckinpah, to Houston, from Luther, Bobby, to Christopher Columbus, all the way down. To Donald and Trump, we didn't cross the borders. The borders crossed us. Who are you calling immigrants? Pilgrim. Those first two were from uh, the collection Mowing Leaves of Grass, and it's so titled because uh, many people are familiar with the, the poet Walt Whitman. What many people might not know is that Walt Whitman was a raging racist. And so um, he was a really big time racist, and he wrote uh, in favor of the Mexican-American War. And in it, he wrote, as a journalist, what is miserable and inefficient Mexico with the grand mission of people in the New World of the Noble Race? And so um, also as a poet, he wrote a poem about California, saying, California, our teachers will bust American love. And this writing is in the 1850s. So what's happening in the 1850s in, in the United States of America? What's happening in the 1850s in the state of California? This is a time of the foreign miners' tax. This is a time of the gold rush. This is a time of uh, the Greaser Act. This is a time of the dispossession of, of Mexicanos from the land uh, and from their lives. This is a time when people are being killed by lynch law. Right? So when you do that, years later, someone like me is born. They get hailed by some people as the best political poet in America. And they write a book called Mowing These Grass. And that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Courses across across the country, which I'm really proud of. Um, uh, this next one, these next poems though, are from uh, uh, the, my, my collection, which is uh, City on the Second Floor, which is much more kind of a sociological type text, uh, much more about the way cities are shaped, the way that when we walk into rooms, you know, in any of these giant cities, it's either said to either exploit us or to exclude us. Like you don't have money walking here, or you better get to work when you, when you walk in here. So that's what City on the Second Floor is all about. This first poem is a persona poem, meaning I pretend to be someone I'm not. I've had people protest me while doing this poem. Don't protest me. I'm not this person. I'm not pretending to be a bigot or anything like that. I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything offensive like that. I'm pretending to be a billionaire. So it's like, people are like, oh, I know what you're, you know, we're going to rise up against you. It's like, yeah, hey, I'm not. I came to this open mic in front of seven people to brag on all your faces because I'm a billionaire and that's what billionaires do. Anyways, it's called The Rich. Here we go. The Rich! Well, they're not looking at me. They see an opportunity to grab it. Reach for the stars and they put them in their pocket. Company stays in the red, but they're backed by the government. Storm folk down into lines of pure profit. Research and develop the rich. Wow. They didn't breed. Champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Thoroughbred stallions. Quarterly mansion of the sea. Born horizon blood diamonds. Golden parachutes. Silicon messiahs. Feasting on endangered species. Certain sir platters. One palace is carved. The tips of icebergs. Six figure charters. Vulture capital. Million dollar covers with life like an apple. Insured by suicide nets. Lifestyles of the criminally negligent. But you haven't lived. Until you've launched a car into space for reason. And that's what I call freedom. The rich man. Here's how it is. Dollars and cents. Trademark and rent. Facts and figures, lines and ledger. To ribs and debt, you know the future. Preach productivity. Union busting back to the 100 hour work between the fat. Prince of monopolies. We throw money towards the bets. Is that my friend? It's how the rich stay rich while the rest make poor decisions. And it's pure ecstasy. Living in a lap of luxury. Pushing pharmaceuticals to the market. The market will bear your body to its altar and a life or death bargain. The gospel of wealth. Because it is what it is. That's all it's ever been. The less we spend, the more we keep. You see the rich. Just like me. Two hands, two feet. 
The sky, the sea, one heart that beats the time to make the most of this right, no sympathy. Rich in these deep pockets, all we ever asked was for our fair shirt. Damn it, that's all of it. We're on the streets, scream for peace and justice. We sleep in satin sheets, dream free and guiltless over oceans and terrace, liquidating pensions. Then off to bid on porcelain portraits at billion dollar auctions. You know you need us, you know we're selling your secrets. You know citizens DNA kids watching the puppets on television, debate freedom, free speech, fascism, democracy. And reach the earth and punch the ozone and fuel the economy with space stations? Yes, space stations! Are you trading the red planets? We're gonna survive this lava pit in the rainforest, colonizing the moon! We're the rich! Who the f are you? We'll privatize the water supply, then copyright the tears falling from your eyes, burn all down. What the hell are you talking about? The ice caps already melted. You want to start some eat the rich while we kill your kids? <laughs> One carbon footprint, one gas house emission, one oil rate, one nail ship, one. Free trade agreement at a time, we'll get away with it too. Nothing we say or do is ever held against us. Have you been paying attention? You're rich. <laughs> All right, and this one I do not have memorized. Right. Uh, this one is, a, is a Dr. Jose Prado's favorite poem of mine, which I think he believes I actually have. I'm not an out of actor either, but it is loosely based on uh, how uh, it is me in a different life, I guess. Okay, so it's called The Pope of Broadway, and I did get, um, I did get uh, Eloy Torres' permission uh, for that title um, after the book was published. <laughs> you said it was okay. Uh, yeah, I'm right now. God bless you. All right, here we go. Right. An Arab, an Italian, a Jew, a Puerto Rican, an Inuit, an American Indian, a Mongolian, and a Mexican walk into a bar. Anthony Quinn orders a drink. The man, the myth, the mural, the Greek, citizen of the world, the Pope of Broadway, patron saint of acting, while ethnically ambiguous for ambiguity and ethnicity, both reside in the eye of the producer, Cliff Curtis, Oscar Isaac. Give me two first names and I'll give you the whole world. For every leading man is a hero, and to every hero a journey, to every journey a tropical sidekick. Damp sands, a light brick, give me a boulder and a turtleneck, our tanning bed and bronzer, and I'll give you every brown man for every climb this season, spelled M-A-N, melanin is needed. And I know this town, no one better than knows me. Grow up in its shadows, Sun Valley, day trips to Melrose and Sunset, Hollywood nights on Highland, my brother, our friends are two cousins, brown kids from the valley, Walking the stars in a tinsel sound on an avenue of dreams, waiting on Columbus. My brother had us convinced whatever it was, we had it. First one to find work, Cholo number nine, Loco number three, Vato number six. Riz, to toast the sky with no limits. Team captain said, my boys, you're all up next. First and only speaking gig immortalized as an Armenian mechanic, and that Vato hasn't found work since. And I know this country. I know better than it knows itself what it likes, what it hides, what it ignores, what it won't admit, and what that says. I heard a story once that when Anthony Quinn married into the Mill family, it was on the condition that his very Mexican family would not be attending the wedding. And that's a ticket. The price of admission it is what they are buying, which would best be selling. Let me tell you one thing. When Dallas, Minneapolis, Ann Arbor, Orlando, Toledo, Scranton, Ohio send their people, they don't send their best. They're vain, they're shallow, they're narcissists. I hear some of them are good waiters. Fly to the sociopaths, transplants, turn cynics, chasing down plans, hopes, and ambitions on roads paved in ways I can never even begin to dream to imagine. Talking themselves to finding a place by all that is not, it's them. Fakes, fakes, fake as F, F, them. They don't know this town, this region, history. Hell, they don't even know the valley. The valley is swap meets, car shows, the 118 San Fernando Road, ghost stories on Gravity Hill, the five, Pedro Los Papas, the legend of Richie Valens, the mural of Danny Trejo, and that's as real as it gets. The valley is me, my theos, my cousins, and a laptop connected to television, watching Andy Ruiz defeat Anthony Joshua for the heavyweight championship of the world. Our world is Andy the Swerve being mocked for his appearance. And Ruiz said that every Mexican has a dream, underestimated, overlooked, mocked, exploited, neglected, disrespected. And yet here we stand with more talent than we ever began to dream to imagine. For every Mexican is a hero, and to every hero a journey, and to every journey a purpose, and to every purpose a sense of dignity. May every ounce of dignity be poured into a dream, never forgetting the compromises and sacrifices, how this road was paved, emerging from the shadows on the shoulders of giants on some brighter day with the Pope of Broadway dancing in celebration of it all. And the uh, last poem is uh, 
uh, is about the uh, you know Grumpen um, Grumpen uh, Serena. So Grumpen Serena. So anyways, anyways, this one's about Serena. It's called El Serena. There we go. That's my mom's name. El Serena. My mom's in the audience. I was born on the east side of Los Angeles, across the tracks from Bandit's in industrial petrified forest. Across the steps, a giant green tarp to customers and gossipers, our abuelitas, from raising the sun to bonds of birds. I spoke Spanish, sold mangoes, papayas, and cherries, my favorite. As a child, I could never quite make a connection to the broken, empty bottles across the steps, to the broken, empty men who poured out the West factories across the tracks. So my cousins and I would gather for rocks and dirt aimed directly for the head. And the man would yell back something like, what do you kids know about life? <laughs> and we yelled back, take that, drunks. That was messed up. That's how it was, growing up. Where Valley climbs up and over and so Elsewhere, in the 1950s, my mother's father, technician by trade, by birth the prince of a man, and a backwards king that held him back, that treated him different for the radiance of unapologetic brown skin, as a family of six on a single income. There's hard fought genius in me, older than my mother's womb. December 18, 1981, after months of fear and absence, my father makes his return. My aunt moves her constantly that she does not want to see you. You know what she did? It would be best for everyone if you were just to leave. My mother holds a newborn, her only begotten son. There is a pain in me, older than my father's blood. As a child, I can never quite make a connection between his fingers or my throat and the anguish in his chest, the suffering older than my father's mom's. His father's whiskey. Grandfather short temper, long lived legacy to time. History does not care to remember because beatings are not fit for scrapbooks and genealogy shame rarely make their way to the oral tradition of campfire. There is a burning it. in my heart. The time cannot trace. We got from my father's the suburbs treated me different. One day in the workforce, I told my boss last night I met beautiful an intelligent ass, where at World Heights was that, east side of Los Angeles, ass incredulous, you met an intelligent woman in East Los Angeles? <laughs> I want to slap the cavalry from the smirk, beat the manifest destiny out of his name badge, but needing a paycheck, I stood in the weakness of silence, the pain and anguish of generations long past alive and sickened in my chest, there's a shame. Attempt to upon us. Older than the tongues of bigots. Walked off job. Marched off lock is up for the cause of the world that has told us no. That has told us different. I've chosen yes. Yes, I'm Chicano. Yes, Mexican. Yes, indigenous, that brown skin and bleed red. Yes, unafraid and unashamed. My passion, my potential, my intelligence. Yes, the fire in my chest opens my eyes to feel its strength. And yes, as a matter of fact, some of the most radiant, gifted, talented, beautiful, intelligent women I have ever met reside on the east side of Los Angeles, just across the steps from the streets where I was born. Yes, I am all of this and more. I. Like you, I made stars. You, like me, so full of pain, or brimming with genius. Listen to no one would make you feel good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, sir. We need that fire. Um, always need it, especially now. And I'm, I'm going to bring in a few of the other elements. A little bit of earth, a little bit of wind, maybe some uh, water. Um, I'm going to start with a poem. Uh, I'm an interesting thing by coming back here, and I love reading here. And you know, was, um, I was in all these jails when I was a teenager, including the 
substation here. <laughs> so we kind of like to get back to remembering all the, all the sheriff's substations I was in, you know, one over the other. Um, and so and when I was a teenager, as you know, from reading over my hair, we'll get into it now, but I, uh, I was homeless for three years. So I knew a lot of these parks and streets, and I knew where who to bug, and I knew where to get the guy that I knew there was a heroin. I, you know, I knew this is the way it was a long time. I'm, 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 I'm like a, an addict talking about the past. I didn't know there. Uh, but I think it's important to remember some of these things so that we don't get any more where you people following into all these crimes. And I think that's my hope that we don't lose any more. Um, so one of the, the polling over me has to do with homelessness because uh, not only because I was homeless, but I worked with homeless people. When I was in Chicago, I was working for the homeless coalition, uh, the Chicago coalition for the homeless, and I would go into these big giant shelters to um, do teaching, poetry, and readings, and we did chapbooks and met some really great people. Because I always think, no matter how bad things are, don't. Don't lose your spirit. The poverty spirit is the worst part of poverty. You know, and so with the poetry and the art, it just lifts them to keep wanting to struggle, to keep wanting to better themselves. So this poem has to do with that. It's called Grime and Gold. And uh, I'm in I'm in the Pacoima, San Fernando, somewhere area now, up in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, so I was going to a lot of cabinets, talking to people, and we were trying to help them know we can. And uh, this image came to me, I wonder where I'll read it. It goes like this. <clears throat> South wind, curly dust, cars and trucks lend rhythm to a Pacoima viaduct dance. With plastic bags, fast food cartons, leaves and scrap paper trapped in a Milky Way underground. Under the roadway, as tires and engines growl above, a houseless man among an enclave of weathered tents sits on a bucket, his arms splayed over a splintered plywood board on a makeshift desk of boxes. He draws. Next to him, an illustrated book of birds, dirt crusted into cracks of spine and cover. Using a pencil, the man carefully incisions the lines, methodically shades in a spectrum of black to gray on a torch sketchbook page. His most valued asset in a place of no asset except for what sings in his bones. He draws and the city breathes with him. No smog, no industry, no rumbling soundtracks from above. The birds, the air, the land, the sun, the trees, the earth. On that black paper, the man designs another landscape with no poisons, with new roads that curve toward new homes. He draws birds, yet I witness in his hand what launches new spaces new parks, new abodes, where everyone belongs because nobody has to stake a claim because all of us are claimed. Where nobody is blocked from flowering, so burdens, burdens appear all the time, everywhere, every day, every hour, every click of the clock's seconds hand. The drawn birds pause from grind to gold. How the more you excavate, the finer things become. How the lines fly, fly, fly in the vortex of dust and carbons. Yes. So I, um, I'm reading poems that haven't been published in the book yet, but I'm, I'm starting to read them around so that I'll read poems you might have heard. Uh, so this was kind of relating back to the past. Uh, I was a heroin addict for seven years. I didn't really write that much about it. Um, maybe a couple of poems. I, it's in all this writing, but I never really wrote about it, so I decided to do a poem, and I hope it's the last poem I ever write in my hair. You know, I don't, it's just something I don't really um, want to deal with too much, but one thing I noticed, uh, and I'm okay with anybody that believes in heaven and everything, I'm fine with it, but I noticed that people like to make a heaven this peaceful, no pain, and I keep thinking, they almost want to be on a heroin high. <laughs> like, that's why you do heroin. No pain, everything is done. Like, 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 they speak about heaven like a big giant, you know. Okay. So I, this poem is called The Peace of Death in Life. Because that's the way I felt heroin. So I have to 
after a while, if you're using up there, when you're doing the toilet, uh, but in the beginning, you're, you're there in the floor, euphoric thing. Yeah, yeah, and some people know. And then after a while, I ain't about that no more. But anyway, this is the poem. Heroin soundtrack, bitches brew. Trumpets like trains squeeing around a bend. The way rainwater murmurs along a concrete river, skulls whispering you to sleep. Pain awash in groves from the tip of the toes through legs streaming through the pit of his stomach, covering the whole body in hazy blue wash. Miles knew the chords to blow. If you know anything what I'm talking about, Miles Davis was my favorite thing to listen to when I was like, there's just something about the music. Mm -hmm. I chipped to soften the edge when things got bad. When it did, I didn't want to be around anyone. Stash away my own array and score, loitering inside my own high and my own morose pose. Yet Micaela and homie Sharky often joined me, even a hino or two and strangers as raindrops fell. I recall the headstones of Evergreen, Evergreen Cemetery, where I leaned back to nod and scribble on torn pieces of papers, poems tracked with collapsed veins. I recall my small garage room with no running water or heat and feeling the peace of death cover me as a white sheet in my collapse. The shadows felt so compelling. Even when I stopped breathing and homeboys Force me up, ice and pits and groin, milk injected to unsing the song. To quit, I had to accept never ending break. Numbness only meant demise. Now constant pain is constant reminder, a holy surrender. Life is pain. Pain is life. When the pain's gone, so am. Brother Obesiva, thank you, brother, for being here. He's got an amazing, powerful memoir of the death of my father, the Pope. I recommend it. It is one of the most compelling books about and his language, his story, but bringing you in. And it's very hard to read. And that's good, because he's honest. He's a genuine person. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> great, great to have all these voices coming up and, and talking. So this is another poem, and uh, for 40 years, one of the ways I give back, you know, I went to jails, I was in a different institutions, you know, uh, I was in two adult facilities, but what happened is the Chicano movement came in and saved me, I don't know how else to say it. I was in the streets, but I met the Chibamba Rays, I met these activists, and I got, I got taken by, they had a dream, you know, a better world, and I, and I got taken by it, and especially the, the radical end of it, and I was, like, I want to know this stuff, you know. I was hungry for it, and, I, and my mentor told me that I was the hungriest guy of all my guys in my neighborhood, because he tried to recruit all these people. He said, but you're the hungriest guy, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I didn't have nothing in my neighborhood. I was saying, thank you, everybody, all my stuff, thank you, but when there was nothing but dirt roads, and you know, you know how it was. That's why I was all around the east side, because we all, we all knew everybody. But uh, he, uh, he saved me, and the community saved me from doing state prison time. Uh, when I was facing a lot of years in prison. And they stepped up to the court and said, look, this guy did some bad things. He's been in trouble, but he's, he's doing good things. He's trying to change his life. I was 18 years old, and I was. I was one foot in, one foot out. You know how that was. Um, and the judge, for some reason, said, I never seen anybody do this. And all these people showed up in court for him. People wrote letters. He gave me a break. He gave me time to I did get convicted, did it in the men's county jail. And I walked out, and I've never gone back to jail for criminal acts. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm asking you to un un you know, unravel a little bit your, your, your poetry, your magic. Um, uh, how was it that you, that you uh, draw connections for us uh, in such a way? Well, I'll try to be very direct. I think a lot of the criminality is um, it's because of poverty. It's because of things that we really can't help. It's because of over-policing. They're really, I mean, the sheriff's deputies are some of the worst. Mm -hmm. And we have history now. Even when we, I don't mind talking about it, it doesn't change when you change the name of the guys. 
their bad news. The sheriffs have done so much damage in our community. They have organized these gangs that we've known about them for 40, 50 years and probably longer. They knew we were, they were doing drive-bys to start gang warfare. I wrote it in my book and people say that couldn't be true. And then it all comes out. 20 years later, in 93 in Linwood, they found they actually convicted people and the Vikings for doing it. And then now more people got convicted. In other words, when you live in these neighborhoods, and this, not just the sheriffs, LAPD or whatever, there's a design to hold our kids hostage. And what I mean by that is when I was growing up in Lomas, and then we moved to San Gabriel, uh, they would stop us at seven, eight, nine years old and get a detention worker in you. They didn't necessarily arrest you, stop you for anything. You didn't do anything. You're in the corner, uh, they would harass you and everything else, and then they stop you again for something else. And pretty soon when you do finally get arrested, I got a first arrest at 13, I have almost bought a juvie. You know what I mean? It's like, what happened? Because they had a detention record. You know what I'm saying? They're keeping track of our kids. This is what they used to do and they still do. I find that to be the gardens that we're watering. The poverty is there, the parents are being broken up, parents are, you know, fathers are being pushed out. You know, it, it, and mothers have two or three jobs. Uh, I was a latchkey kid like a lot of my son was a latchkey kid. There was a lot of that going on. It wasn't the fault of the parents necessarily, they were just trying to survive. That's why I say my parents were trying to survive. This is all by design. Do I think I don't got personal responsibility? I get it. I made choices, I get that part. And when I go into prisons, we try to work both ends of it. But I can't deny that there's a design, you know what I'm saying, in our society. The prison meant the way the system is set up. Can't deny that. Even when I tell people, can you make a choice that doesn't keep falling into that trap? You know what I'm saying? Giving them that power that you can do something different. But I don't want to forget that that's what I'm talking about. We're, crew, we're nurturing these gardens of criminals and gangsters. And, you know, we were bodies. We weren't gang, gangs. We never called ourselves gangs. Now everybody's stuck in, now I'm a big gang, you know. We called ourselves bodies, we were homies. I mean, homies in a good sense. Now homies is somebody you got a gun next to you. That's not what it was. The homie had palabra. i just say one last thing. Even in the barrios in the worst neighborhoods when I was growing up, you didn't judge a person because he had a gun or he could shoot somebody or he, you judged them if they had palabra. You know what I mean? They could be trusted. That's how you judge people. Nowadays you can't, you can't really, trust anybody. And I, I'm, not, I'm not making it up. I've been in the prisons. I love working with these guys, but I know the world that they're in. So I just want to mention that. The gardens of trauma, the word nurturing constantly with all this stuff that society does and the pu pushing people into the worst poverty just creates this, 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 uh, this place that eventually becomes prison. Um, uh, Matt, um, you know, you and I have uh, done some work as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we started that uh, reading. We did a whole reading. Yeah. We read Capital together over over the span of a year. Uh, and we had discussions and and um, we discussed it, and then we closed uh, with a poem that you right. that you share. And I thought that was that was wonderful. Um, one of the one of the uh, terms that came up uh, almost organically uh, from those um, from those discussions was a term uh, that we that were we were floating around uh, as we were having these discussions, uh, and the term was the geography of words, you know, geography of words, um, which is why I'm uh, which is why I think about your poetry as uh, an ontological exercise. You know, I can't help but I have to use these words because you know these are the words that I use in in my uh, in my in my work uh, as a professor and you know all the all the all the university stuff uh, that I, that I do. Uh, I'm concerned about about communicating and and and, and uh, expressing understandings about the ways that space positions us uh, and how space uh, shapes what we can do. It either, it either, space either liberates us like this evening or space like across the park yeah. incarcerates us like some other evenings, you know? Um, can you speak to um, can you speak to uh, your attention to, to place 
and to space in your poetry. I'm, I'm you know, uh, earlier I wrote down words like, um, you know, El Sereno. Um, I, I wrote down words like Occupied America, the Alley River, Devil's Highway, uh, Aslan, and so forth. But these are these are actual places. How do they figure uh, in your poetry, and what are you t what are you telling us? Yeah. Well, I try to have like pretty complete thoughts. So, uh, Mowing the Grass was much more of an historical context, going through a lot of uh, the different various uh, points of uh, names and dates and places and times. That in many ways, I figured would would help explain uh, the conditions that that, that people Chicago people find themselves in uh, in 2022, and why it is that um, this sort of this happens. You know, like uh, most of us, what ends up happening is that our history is denied to us, and so we end up in a situation where we understand that we're we're being uh, you know oppressed or negatively impacted by um, any number of any number of, of things that are attacking us. Uh, but we don't really have the historical context of why it happens. We might learn it in college. We might have somebody in the family who will tell us, you know, our history. So we're talking about these things. But <clears throat> for many of us, we don't. We just have that we don't have, it's not part of the, the general Americana uh, lexicon. It's not part of the general American education. It's not something that you're automatically going to learn when you go to school. It's something that you have to be taught from some kind of outside source. And so, I, you know, compiling, reading a lot of books, reading, you know, 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 reading um, was it uh, Race Class in Southwest by uh, Mario Rara, reading, you know, reading you know, Luis's work, reading, reading uh, Urea, that's where, or, or down, uh, down uh, the, the Devil's Highway at the reference room. So reading a lot of different, like reading a lot of different influences, that, that's kind of what, where a lot of them these these when it comes to a lot of screening, a lot of like ethnic studies type texts and that. Where a city on the second floor, that one was much more about kind of spatial relations of the city, like, like you know, using LA as a case example, but it drew many places. Uh, the title itself, City on the Second Floor, comes from the Hotel uh, uh, Bonaventure, you know, where, where we have these like bridges that connect buildings so that people can come from out of town, they can do their business, they can go upstairs, they can go to Kiko's, they can go to Starbucks, they can enjoy a latte, they don't, they don't ever, ever, have to, ever have to encounter anybody on the street who might be catching a bus or you know, might be really down, might be even more down on the luck, you know. They don't, they don't have to deal with them, so that's where the title City on the Second Floor came from. And so, you know, students and floors will look at, at, at the, the gross um, disparities of wealth and, 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 uh, and poverty that exist in, in LA, but they don't exist in the vacuum, they don't exist in the ether, they don't exist uh, in the hearts and minds of people, they exist in physical spaces. You are too poor, you cannot be in this room right now. You know, like, you, you, you're walked to work, and you can get to work, we don't pay you $7.25 or actually dollars now. we don't pay you, you know, minimum wage or nothing, get to work. So everything, every, like, physical, area you go into, uh, for the most part, except for great public institutions like the East LA Library. Uh, uh, you have to pay to be there, or you have to, uh, you have to pay to be, actually, you have to pay to be everywhere. You have to either pay uh, with the money in your pocket or with the, uh, with the, the, the energy in your body uh, and your time, um, you know, which is when you sell your, your labor power, as, as, as Marx would say, um, to, to be in a place. You, know, you have to either be working or spending money. In, in most places that we enter into. So this book which we'll look at that is the title seems like Florida is not necessarily about people who are incredibly wealthy or people who are, you know, all the way um, uh, ejected from the economy, um, of, of which you know, there's a lot of that in the book. There's a lot of extreme wealth and extreme poverty. But the concept of seeing the second like floor was about people who are working, you know, people who are working and maybe even in a managerial kind of position. Um, and, uh, and looking down at people below because they think they're connected to billionaires who really you're on the second floor of a high rise of a skyscraper, right? And so the arrogance and delusions um, that we tend to harbor um, about, you know, about our, you know, about our brothers and sisters, our, our literal siblings that we might be doing a little better than, you know, about our nieces and nephews who can't get it together, we're so much higher than, you know, about these kinds of delusions that we, we tend to harbor about people who um, we think that that's why you're there, I'm here, and like, you know, you're like one pitch away from, you know, being on the street too. So that's kind of a, where, the, where the title draws its, its, its name, from the physical spaces we enter and from the delusions we often carry given our, 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 our situation, you know. It, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when I mean, you think about physical spaces. Right now, you know, we have this panel here and then there's an audience, right? So that, I mean, that's done for a reason, you know, and it's done for the, for the you know, the, the the, the, the reason of the evening, but you know, it's it's. I know, I start having like these weird existential crises when I talk too long, and like the audience doesn't interact. 
And I just started thinking, like, you know, I'm just like a talking primate, ball of dirt, spinning around a ball of gas. You know, I'm not this, I'm not this author on that stage. I'm just, uh, like, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, you know, a bipedal. You know, just kind of right here with a lot of words. But anyways, but, but, that, but that's you know, but, but truly, we are set up a certain way, and this is for you know, for a great, you know, for the edification of, uh, of, of the community and for. For you know to be a bigger fan, but really, I mean, it's really something to really think about. Just to, to kind of like, I don't know, to like go into the place you are and ask questions. And I have like almost an out of body experience from the routine in which you live your life, and you will suddenly discover that uh, that you're you're being horrible to this. I mean, you're we're, we're being robbed every day, every minute, and every moment. So we, we, we need to stand up and fight. So that's what City Tech like, is all about. Thank you. Uh, I want to open it up for uh, Q&A section uh, this evening. Uh, by way of this particular closure, uh, I'll set this down. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, one of the readings that we do in my sociology courses is um, we read Franz Fanon, Black Skins, White Masks. And in the last chapter of the book are two sentences that are very important that I'd like to paraphrase a little bit. Um, uh, Franz Fanon uh, finishes the book with a sentence that says, Oh, my skin make of me a man who always questions. Um, or something to that effect. Um, I just want to say uh, that you know your poetry, Luis, your poetry, uh, Matt, um, are the sort are are the sort of poems that are in keeping with that uh, uh, Fanonian tradition, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we are compelled. <laughs> I'm you know I'm compelled to ask questions, of course, but anyway, I just hope that that um, you know we can we can continue the dialogue by way of your questions. Questions about yourselves relative to their poetry and vice versa. And then uh, I'll just let, you know, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I have a question. Uh, so I was struck by uh, Luis's poem uh, about animals. That was, that was phenomenal. I love the immediacy of the poem. And, and I, I just think that that's a very relatable experience for a poet or for a writer to encounter someone and, and make a promise of, to write about them. And, uh, I think that's a, a, a very familiar experience. And so my question was, uh, I know Matt has written, has done that as well, has written poems about people and then uh, confronted uh, the people that the poems were written about or, or engaged with them. So I was wondering, what, what has that experience been like in your work when you've written about someone and then interacting with them, with it as a piece of art? Well, I would say that um, always running got me more trouble. <laughs> because I did write about real people and I didn't change any names except uh, uh, I did change the barrio names, the gang, the gang kids, because and I changed the crimes and nobody could follow the crimes. You know, I didn't want to be ratting on anybody, you know. <laughs> but everything I wrote about was true and it got me into a lot of trouble. My family couldn't stand the book. I had homies, half the neighborhood was loving it, the other half hated it, you know how it goes. And, and the only thing I could stand on is, you know what? I have to tell the truth the way I saw it, I lived it, and it was important because a lot of other people who didn't grow up in that little neighborhood related. They understood, they got it. I got people from all over, and it wasn't just Chicanos, you know, blacks and Native Americans that did a lot of work in reservations, uh, poor white people. Uh, I met these Hamang uh, people in Michigan who loved the book, you know. I remember there was a, a big battle with Cambodians and, and Mexicans in Long Beach, and I would meet with the Chicanos, but then all these Cambodians, what, we, 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 can you sign their book? They love the book. So what I'm just saying is that telling the truth can either hurt or heal. And it was meant to heal. And so I do come across people. By the way, uh, Animal is uh, Eddie Lopez, who was, who was a contender and heroin just messed him up. He could never fight again. He only lost one fight out of all those fights. He was really good. He would have been one of the best. He would have been before Reeves. Before Reeves. Yeah. He would have, you know, but uh, he, he didn't do too good. He passed. I know people were asking about him and asked about him and whatever happened to him, he, he died. Um, so uh, people come and go. But I'm very careful now <laughs> because I did that and exposed a lot of things that people got upset. Um, 
and other people loved it. I'm very careful now to make sure that either I talk to people ahead of time, really I'm doing this now. It calls you back. I met with my whole family before I put it out there. And I told them what I was going to do. Half, most of the family was stunned, you know, because I was going to reveal stuff that I had to reveal. I mean, one of them is, I had on my talk about is my dad uh, was a pedophile. I didn't know that. He molested little girls. He molested my sisters. I didn't know. He never molested me and my brother. I didn't know what was going on. I was in the street. And I'll tell you a sad story. One time as an adult, my sister got mad at me. She says, man, when you were on the street and you weren't around, I hated you because I wish you were the only one that stood up to him. I didn't know him. She said, I hated you my, all my life because you, you weren't there for me. Can you imagine? And I had no clue. So these are hard things to talk about, but they need to be talked about. And, and just so you know, my family, I told them I'm talking about my dad. I don't care what anybody says. Some people were upset, others were like, hmm. Uh, I don't make him a monster. That's not my point. He's a hardworking Mexican guy. People loved him. They thought he was the nicest guy in the world. He was a janitor, retired, you know. Uh, but they didn't know this other life. It's in there. He will always be known for that. But he's not a monster. You know what I'm trying to say? He was my dad, and I, and I hate to say this, I love that old fool. You know, I love that fool. You know, and it's a sad part because your own family is what destroys you. Your own family, you learn to hate the people you love. I hated my dad for 40 years. I won't talk to him. And I would just tell you the last part of that story was, it's in my book, but my mom, I was in Chicago, and my mom, he was dying that day. He had stomach cancer. He was already emaciated. He couldn't even talk. And she called me that day. He's going to die. Yes, I said, to Papa. You got to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. I told her, I don't want to talk to him. Why'd you even call me? I don't want to talk to him. She said, this guy, to Papa. I said, I eat. Yes, I And I'm like, no, I don't want to. No, no, no. And then she put the phone to his ear. My mom's very stubborn. Thank God. <laughs> she, she put the phone to his ear. So then I, I thought what I would do is I was going to curse him up. Why not? You know, maldiciones, you know. Why enough? Whatever, you know. But I couldn't do it, man. So the only thing I could do was tell him something he never ever told me. And I have, I'm looking over because his story about his dad is powerful, amazing. So he, I think he'd appreciate this. I told him I love you, dad. It's the only thing that came from me. And he couldn't speak. My mom said that she heard, she saw his face. He had an expression soon after he died. But it was the right thing. He will always be known for what he done. He would, my sisters, at least my youngest sister, you know, hates him and who knows who other people here. He tried to molest my daughter. It's one of the things that happened. So anyway, but I couldn't let him go that way. You know what I'm saying? And I know that it was better for me. It was probably better for me than for him. The poison of hate was hurting me. So I did it really for me. You know, um, love. The only thing I could give, the only thing I could ask him for, and I wanted him to go with it. Uh, uh, and that's all that we can do. He died. He's gone. I can't do nothing about it. But we can't be so hateful that we can't be open to that. So anyway, I so, yeah. A question I have is how do you reclaim language, um, you know, like Spanish or even now through your poetry and also follow to that is how do you um, choose to stitch your words together to have that impact on what generation do you think you're writing for? Oh, well, that's really good. It's a great, but I don't know. What's this? Oh, um, well, you know, I, I, you know, I've never really tried with uh, with uh, now as much. Uh, it's more, you know, I think you're a little like kind of like Spanish kind of writing, and I, you know, it's it's it's, it's kind of comes out of just kind of like activist culture where like you know, um, you you go in a situation where people like really. Right? So it's not like, you know, there's like something important, we're doing something important, so it's gonna be in Spanish, right? And so it's kind of like written in, in that in that kind of uh, that kind of way, a lot, a lot of women in these grasses anyways. Um, and, uh, but for the next book that I'm working on, I'm gonna try and work more of that. I'm gonna try and do more of that. I've been working on one, I uh, was looking at these words, I, was, I, was, I came up with this idea to write a poem, it was a like story, a narrative poem, about this guy who, who was, um, his father died in an accident, and his uncle was really instrumental in raising him. His uncle's in prison. They're going to go drive and see him. He's locked up in, uh, in, in uh, Ellington Towers, and they're like out in Blythe. They're out there, like, like hundreds of miles away. 
and they're driving out here, and then the prison's on lockdown, and there's just no explanation, they're just sent away. And then he stays, and he tries to, he's, his uncle talking about box, he tries to scatter box in front of him, in front of, uh, outside the jail, right, just so they can see him. And his uncle also talking about attack. And so he goes down the train yard, and he tags up the name that his uncle had given him. And I chose this not one word for that, which was the nemesis, which means you will travel, you will live. And then the train, the entity, the trains crossing the whole country with like this name that he was given, you know, seeing the whole country, you know. And so this whole poem about all these things that are being stripped of this person, this whole things that, you know, and trying to have control of his life and the fact that it's only when he's alone in the world, it's quiet that he feels the power, you know, that this name that he wrote on a train will cross, you know, all these different state lines and we'll see all these different cities. And you know, and we'll do so, you know, largely, you know, in the dark night, and you know, through open plains, through all kinds of things where the world isn't there to 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 say to you know to to, to put these constrictions on it. So that's how that that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find ways where it's, where where it fits organically into the stories I'm telling, where it fits organically into the things that I'm doing. I, I don't ever want to to anything I do to feel like tacked on, you know. I don't ever I don't want I don't want to feel like it's just I just threw it in there, you know. So I want to try and Make sure that whatever I do, um, and people get the, 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 you really don't love on this, like you know, like you know, a question about authenticity, like you know, like you know, the, the, we need to tell our own stories and don't tell other people's stories. But the truth is, I'm very prolific, and I already told all my own stories. I mean, <laughs> the story I'm gonna tell next is just gonna be like, you know, and then I, you know, I wasn't kind, I didn't rewind. It was back in the '90s. <laughs> no, like who cares, right? So all my like important. Impactful stories I told. So now I'm going to try, you know, and write, you know, new stories and then new things and things that necessarily, you know, they're drawn from, from a lot of experiences. Of course, I don't repetitively often, you know, tell their stories, but you know, that, that that sort of thing is 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 where this next this next one's going. So, you know, coming up with lots of cultural references, doing a lot of research and figuring that out. You know, that's kind of where I'm at now, and, and in the process, I'm learning. You know, and, and in the process, I myself am, am doing what you talk about, ocean reclaiming and. and Really re-experiencing these things, um, you know that's kind of a, that, that, that's my experience in my, in, in for you know none of your business. No, <laughs> no but that, that's 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 really you know um, more working on this next collection. This other one's full like Spanish. You know, I just want to say something on that. I, my struggle my whole life is to dominate any language because they sp beat the Spanish out of us in the schools, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, I remember, and I tell the story, Matt knows this, when I was six years old in Watts, I went to pick up my sister, she was in kindergarten, I was first grade, and I said something in Spanish. The teacher slapped me across the face uh, in front of the whole class, and I got swatted there for speaking Spanish. Uh, but they didn't teach us English very well. The struggle to dominate a language is our struggle. And I try to encourage people, don't let people take your language away. Uh, I don't have formal language uh, training in Spanish, but I speak Spanish because it's my people's language. I, I get it, it's colonial, I get all that stuff, but that's what our hands to speak, and I'm gonna dominate that. I'm dominating English, and English wasn't our language. It's something we had to learn here, but I was gonna dominate it, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna control this language, and I'm gonna tell these stories, and now I even got a chance to read now what I read and now what in Mexico. We had a poetry read in Nahuatl, and I got to read in a big book festival in Mexico City, which we're going back to Mexico City next, next month. But also, uh, at the Hammer Museum, I read a Nahuatl poem. Uh, on a whole conference on endangered languages. So this is how you do it. Get good at language, get good at two or three languages, whatever, and get out there and learn it and don't be afraid and get good at it though. Dominate these languages, don't let anybody take your tongue away from you. That's right. Beautiful talks, beautiful words. I'm glad I came. Uh, I, I, I'm from El Monte. I teach in El Monte. All right. And, like I said, the police are very invasive. Yeah. You know, they shot those two cops, and blue lights matter all over, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they got cops on campus who are extra, who are taking an extra step to get to know our kids. Mm -hmm. So they get to know them really well. It's very invasive and predatory, and, oh. and a way to enter yeah. policing, right? Yeah. So it's been very dark lately, but oh, you know. Uh, I'm gonna say that your work is the light in my class. Mm. It, it engages the kids that they're targeting in my school. Mm. And I just wanna ask you, you know, because uh, I, I see you elders, 
I, I, I think of our ancestors, and I was just going to ask you, uh, who are elders and ancestors that give you the fire to see through the darkness? Mm. Well, you know, I think you're drawing an energy that's inside of us already. Our ancestors are inside of us. They're in our genetic memory. We have to know how to tap into it. And I tell people, you got all your ancestors in you. I know it may not seem that way, but they're all there. It's somehow the genetic memory is there. And we've been told not to tap into it. I try to tap into it because um, they're always going to guide you and be there. And it's important to know how to do that. The other thing I have to say is, again, I have to thank these Chicano radical, the radical wing of the Chicano movement that came and found me and pulled me out of the mess and gave me visions and, and ideas and things like that. We got to do that with our young people. We got to help our young people. Now, they're already stepping up. I'm seeing them. They're already out there, but uh, they still need elders. You know what I'm saying? They need good mentors. And we, I would encourage everybody, help these young people to get out there and get strong and know their language. Now we got the stuff with the city council here in, in LA. And you know what, man? We need new voices. We need these new <laughs> people. We can't have these old people. And, and the sad thing is I knew Gil Cedillo when he was really strong. And Kevin, too, and, and Nudie from the Valley. See, they were like, they, we thought they were going to be our hope and our it's it betrayal of all of us. But you know what it teaches us? Don't ever be complacent. Yeah. These people get off on their own thing. We should have been on them from the beginning. We, we've got to be on them all the time. So I would say uh, this, more mentorship, more teaching. Help these young people. Guide them, show them. I don't mean beating them down. I mean really show them a, a way to go. And then let them go their own way, too. So it's important that we, we do what you're saying. So people mentored me, people guided me, some of people stepped up. I, we need to step up for others. And there is hope. We do have the young lady who asked the question, is an up and coming poet? And we've got a Good. young man here a light blue t-shirt who's running for the school board. So wow, yeah. yeah. so happy to be here and thank you so much for your for the art that you bring. Um, uh, I um, was fortunate enough to be in a class at Cal State Northridge in 1982 um, that we were teaching me. Mm. And uh, it opened up my mind a lot. And um, I was, you know, raised a white guy, a middle, middle class, um, liberal, and thought that I understood what was going on and it was like, no, actually, <laughs> you don't know what's going on. And uh, so thank you for that. And, um, and I also uh, had a chance to vote for you, which is really cool. <laughs> but, but I just want to, um, I, I noticed I, I, um, you actually gave this book to my elder brother, John Joyce, who was, uh, I, I somehow met him at okay. Casting North or something, I don't know, some, a few years ago. But, um, but I noticed that you talk about Maladon Sameh and some of the other men's leaders and things like that. And I'm just wondering where, what, what are some of the next steps for, you know, you're talking about it, it's, it's woven into everything that you're saying, but if you were to encapsulate, what are the next steps that we, we need to do in this, in the, in, in, I think in these very, very challenging times? Well, I think it's, uh, me personally, I think there's many facets to it, but at least two big ones the personal soul work that we got to do with our young people, with our families. It's really deep work. Maladoma Somme, Michael Mead, others have taught me. A lot of my elders in the Navajo Red Reservation, Lakota, Mexica elders, they taught me the soul work that we need to do. It's very deep work. But I think we do that so we can stay strong for the struggle for a new world. We need to be active in this world. I don't like when people say we do spiritual stuff and get away. Man, do that spiritual stuff so you can strong to take on the system. These are big systems. They're, they're getting worse by the, by the day. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And I get, uh, I'm glad you're running. I, I, I don't like when people give up these, these spaces. I, you know, and I get, I, I ran. People say, why did you run? So what a waste of time. Hey, I, you know what? It's never a waste of time. Mm -hmm. It's always good to occupy the spaces, to raise these issues. I, whether I was going to win or not, I, I ran to, to win. I didn't run not to, but the point is, 
get in there, get in there, fight, and struggle, raise these issues, and and we got to use all of them. But I, I just think what's important is to um, occupy every space to raise all these issues. And I think the vision is in already in us. I, that's why I talk about genetic memory. Somewhere in the original mind of all peoples, and I'm mean, talking about original indigenous mind, which is not primitive, was not barbarians, not savages, was a very complex way of thinking, and we have it in us. And that complex way of thinking, if you tap into, would be about that we're connected to everything and everyone, mm -hmm. that we are not separate from everything, that we have responsibilities to each other, that we can have shared well-being. That was my whole campaign. When I talk about shared well-being, people say, "Well, that sounds great." It's a that's not the world we're in. You got to create that world. You got to struggle for it. A world in which every, the shared well-being of everyone is what we're fighting for. So, I think they're in us. Everybody, and this is not a racial thing, everybody's got to tap into those ideas and those old original mind thinking and get out there with it because the world needs it now. In the complexity of the modern post-industrial world, we tend to think those ideas don't matter anymore. They matter more than ever. And we'll take a last question if anybody wants to. Yes, ma'am. You know what, I think this is a good question for Jose. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> so, so that endanger your job. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I have to police my... <laughs> um, it's, uh, you have to pick your battles. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're asking, as I was hearing you ask the question, I was wondering if you were asking the question as, as what advice Luis would give you the day that you became that professor is how I was thinking. Or are you asking, like, yeah, how, does one, oh, how does one student, deal with that? Even just as a student, all my classmates are, like, very conservative. You know, and uh, going into yeah. teaching, You know, I'll, 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 I guess I, I guess I could say I, I guess I could say this, uh, and it sounds like I'm being simplistic and I'm and I'm brushing it brushing the significance of your question off, but I'm not. I really am not. Um, and it's a story I like to share, and you know, I I, I talk about it with my daughter. I, I kind of tease her a little bit about it these days, you know, because you know she's such a fighter and she's so inspiring. My son is too. You know, uh, but uh, one day when my daughter was 14 years old, she came home and she was crying. And you know, ¿Qué pasó, mija? ¿Por qué está llorando? Why you cry? Why you know? What's the matter? What's the matter, mija? Why are you crying? And she said, because I corrected the teacher, and and he uh, silenced me. You know, he made me feel bad. And I felt that was very angry. I wanted to go. You know. I wanted to go and, and let the teacher know what I was thinking and what I was thinking to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, 
but, but I, of course, I didn't do any of that. Um, and uh, I said to my daughter, well, what did you expect? Not, not to silence her, not to, not to, you know, like to disregard what would happen, but rather to prepare her for, for a life of that, you know? And I said to her, you know, it's gonna get, it's gonna, it's gonna get heavier down the line when you, not if you keep this up, but when you keep this up. And so I think over the years, I think over the years, tanto mi hija como yo, you know, as much her as me, um, I've been very, I've been more selective about the battles and I struggle, you know, I have to say something. I'm, I'm so honored that one of my students is here. You know, I'm, you know, Joshua Buchanan. Uh, I want to thank you so much. It means so much to me that you're here. Um, that's, so, you know, you pick your battles and sometimes you win. All right, so, so I'm really good at fighting people. <laughs> really like really, really good at fighting people. And when you fight with someone, you have to acknowledge that you're fighting. That's just how it starts. You just have to acknowledge that, that you're fighting. And you pick your battles, and if you can walk away, just walk away. Because it's not worth your time, because you're not there to fight with people. You're there to get a degree, you're there to do whatever you're there to do. You're there to meet people, like-minded people, and organize things life. You're not really there to fight with people. You're not there to change people's minds. People's minds are not going to change. But sometimes you got to fight. And so if you have to fight with them, get them to talk. You can lead a conversation with questions. Just ask them questions, ask them questions. Get them to articulate their point. And the minute they say something so ridiculous <laughs> and absurd that it cannot be defended, hold on to it and hammer them over and over and over again until they shut up. Because that, that's how you handle these things. You just find, you just get them talking long enough until they say something that's just totally absurd and then you don't let go of it. You don't let go of it. You don't say much yourself. You just ask questions, ask them questions until they eventually will say something just so ridiculous, just so absurd, and then, and then, and then you smack them with it until they quiet and you go until they, until they walk away. And that's how it's done. You don't owe unprincipled people a principled conversation. Yeah. And when someone's full of, you don't owe them. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We're going to close the sandal back.